Hey folks, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're going to travel back in this episode to March 30th, 1981 and take a look at the attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan. A truly sad but historic day in American history. So why don't we go see if we can't go giddy up for that learning and go get her done right now. So unlike other assassinations, we know who did it, and that would be John Hinckley Jr. He was only 25 when he tried to kill President Reagan. Now, when we take a look at his past, he comes from a very well-to-do family, the Hinckley family, and actually John Hinckley Sr. owns an oil company, and he was actually one of the financial backers of George Bush Sr. in his early political career. The family had moved to Texas, they were friends with the Bushes, and then eventually they're going to move to Colorado, but John Hinckley Jr. had a pretty um, well-to-do upbringing. He was actually also class president in his high school, but I guess the mental disease is going to start to affect him after high school as he kind of becomes a drifter. He actually tried to be a writer. He moved out to California in 1975, but he's going to end up back in Colorado by 1976 and become fascinated with one of the new Hollywood films out. And that's going to be Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. If you've never seen it, you probably go see that movie because it's a really good movie. But he becomes um, really infatuated with Travis Bickle, who is the character that Robert De Niro plays. This is somebody who feels the kind of the world is against him. He wants notoriety in the film. He actually tries to attempt to assassinate a U.S. senator running for president, and he becomes infatuated in the movie with a 12-year-old prostitute played by Jodie Foster. Enter Jodie Foster. So it's said that John Hinckley Jr. had erotomania, where you become kind of sexually fascinated with somebody who you really can never be with. That would be Jodie Foster. So John Hinckley Jr., maybe schizophrenic, hearing voices, um, but he goes after Jodie Foster. He actually enrolled at Yale University in a writing course where Jodie Foster was attending. He talked to her on the phone two times and tried to ask her out, and she turned him down, put notes under her door. It was a little bit creepy. So by 1980, he has kind of made this decision, like Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver, that he needs to get the attention of Jodie Foster by doing something that's going to put him on the map. So he decides he's going to kill the president. Now, in late 1980, he goes after Jimmy Carter. He was actually arrested in the airport at Nashville for having some guns in one of his suitcases, but nobody put together the dots that he was doing this to kill the president. So Ronald Reagan, of course, is going to be elected in November of 1980, take office in January of 1981, and John Hinckley Jr. is soon going to be on a bus heading for Washington, D.C. to shoot the president of the United States. So why don't we travel now to the actual date in question, March 30th. 1981. So about 1.30 on March 30th, he's going to arrive at the Washington Hilton Hotel for a speech to some trade unionists from the AFL-CIO. Um, he entered through what's called the President's Walk, which is kind of a secure walkway at the hotel for politicians and dignitaries. But the limo was parked about 30 feet from where that entrance was. So following this meeting, he's going to come out of that walkway, and he's going to walk past a rope line to the limo. Again, only 30 feet. And this is where John Hinckley Jr. is waiting for him. So John Hinckley Jr. is going to do a 22 caliber weapon with six Devastator bullets. These are bullets that are supposed to explode on impact. And he takes the six shots. We have now have the videotape. See the president coming out now. We just have to watch. I don't know if we can hear this or not. There it is. Shots. Now the first bullet's going to strike press secretary James Brady in the head. And the second and third bullets as well are going to hit targets. Now Timothy McCarthy, who was a Secret Service agent, you could see in the film, basically opens his body up in the line of fire and he takes a shot to the abdomen. We also have Thomas Delahanty, a DC officer who's going to get struck in the neck. A couple of the bullets miss, but one of the last bullets is going to hit the rim of the limo door and ricochet into President Reagan. But President 
President Reagan doesn't know he's been shot. At the same time, Jerry Parr, the special agent in charge, is jumping on Reagan, forcing him into the limo. Now, this decision is going to save President Reagan's life because on first inspection, they could find no bullets, but Reagan starts to cough up blood. Parr actually thinks that he might have broken a rib and he's pierced his lung and he's coughing up blood. But either way, rather than going to the White House, which is where they were going, they're going to force the limo to go to George Washington University Hospital. And that's where they arrive four minutes later. Reagan is going to actually walk in. What a gangster. He thinks he bit his lip, but he's wrong. As soon as he walks into the hospital, he's going to go down on bended knee. Um, his doctor thinks he's having a heart attack, but they turn it over to the ER trauma staff and they're going to immediately cut off Reagan's $1,000 suit. He didn't like that very much. And that's where they're going to find the entry wound. At this point, Nancy Reagan had arrived. I guess Reagan joked to her. He said, honey, I'm sorry. I didn't duck. It's an old boxing joke. Um, but they're going to make the decision to go into surgery. And that's where Reagan's going to lose half of his blood supply. I don't think that most people understand how close Reagan was to death. The bullet ended up one inch from his heart. And this isn't an ordinary bullet. This is an exploding bullet. So Reagan, he is joking up to the last moment. They give him anesthesia. He pulls his mask off and says to the doctors, I just hope you're all Republicans. And then I guess the surgeon, a liberal Democrat, responds back and he says, Mr. President, today we're all Republicans. <laughs> So George Herbert Walker Bush really should be acting kind of presidential now. He's the vice president, um, but he didn't know how serious it was. So first he took off in a plane in Texas to Austin, and then when they find out how serious it is, they start heading for Washington, D.C. But there's this kind of four or five hour time lapse where nobody really knows what's going on. There's this famous exchange. I'll let you watch it. Constitutionally, gentlemen, you have the president, the vice president, and the Secretary of State in that order. And should the President decide he wants to tr transfer the helm to the Vice President, he, he will do so. We'll make that As of now, I am in control here in the White House. So there's definitely some confusion about not only, I guess, the constitutional line of presidential succession, which should be after Vice President Bush, uh, Tip O'Neill, who's the Speaker of the House, and then I guess it would be Strom Thurmond, who is the Senate pro temp, but it's not the Secretary of State, that's for sure. Because you have to remember, at that time period, nobody really knew what was going on, whether this was the act of a lone crazy gunman or this was some type of plot to subvert the United States government. So we're probably going to have to forgive them for their chaos, but that certainly is kind of a momentous time in American history. All right, why don't we take a look at the effects of the assassination? You know, if I'm a social studies teacher, I'm going to go over the effects. Now, in terms of effects, of course, we have the effect of John Hinckley Jr. He's going to be found not guilty being criminally insane. He actually attempted suicide three times. He's going to be confined to St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where he's going to eventually be released in 2016 to, um, under regulations to care for his elderly mother. But beyond that really is kind of this reform movement that sweeps the nation to try to make it harder to claim you're criminally insane. We'll call it kind of mental judicial reform, where they're really going to start shifting the burden from the prosecution having to prove you're sane to the defense having to prove that you are insane, making it harder to actually make that claim. We also have the effect on gun reform. So James Brady, the press secretary who was shot in the head, is going to start what's called Hand Control Inc. That's eventually going to be formed into the nonprofit organization, the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence, which is going to lobby Congress to pass what they believe is common sense gun reform. That's going to culminate not until 1993 with Clinton signing the Brady Bill, which is going to put in mandatory background checks when you purchase firearms to make sure that you don't have some type of mental deficiency. Even Ronald Reagan came around on that, supporting that law by 1991. Another effect is going to be, even though CNN doesn't have its own camera crew, they used NBC pool cameras, they are going to cover that event for 48 hours. So I think it's kind of a milestone in kind of the birth of this 24-hour news cycle. We we also have Tecumseh's curse being broken. If you don't know what that means, you probably want to go watch that video. Go click it down in the description below. And finally, maybe the most severe effect is going to be that on 
the television show Greatest American Hero. Uh, the main character's name was Ralph Hinckley. That's not going to work out. So they're going to change his name to Ralph Hanley. So if you guys can kind of wrap your heads around that, that's pretty big. I'd have to say that. We also have the effect on Nancy Reagan. It's said that the assassination attempt spooked her so much, she started turning to the world of astrology to predict the future so she could protect her president, who's going to make a full recovery. He spent 13 days in the hospital. They're going to slow his schedule down for a few months, but he's going to be out and about before you know it. How about we end with another coincidence? Scott Hinckley, the brother of John Hinckley Jr., was supposed to dine at a dinner date with Neil Bush the day after the assassination. You better believe they canceled that meeting. Keeping up with the creepy coincidences, it was also said that when they went into the hotel room of John Hinckley Jr., they found Catcher in the Rye sitting on the coffee table. Of course, if you know anything about the Lennon assassination, Mark Chapman was obsessed with Catcher in the Rye. It was said that Catcher in the Rye was in the room that Lee Harvey Oswald stayed as well. All right, folks, if you haven't checked out Hip Hughes History, I don't know what you're waiting for. We have like 430 videos, 440 videos. It's just crazy. You can click down in the description below. Go to my website. The Video Arsenal has chopped up those videos into some nice categories. All right, I'm going to say it because I say it at the end of every lecture because I mean it with all my heart. Remember, folks, where attention goes, energy flows, and we'll see you folks next time you press my buttons.